the new one, which just came out, and I haven't taken it yet, we actually have a Red Hat uh, exam, a, a course and an exam for Red Hat OpenStack. So uh, if you want to be able to demonstrate to potential employers that you have subject matter expertise with OpenStack, certainly experience is the best way. No one is going to tell you, hey, take a class and you're going to go be an expert, like back in the Microsoft days. I'm an MCSE. You should pay me $70,000 a year. Well, what were you doing last week? I was a bicycle repairman. <laughs> and yes, I taught that class. And the dude that was in there was like, this is my last class. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so um, definitely, if you uh, if you want to take some training, we can help you with that. So we're going to talk a little bit about, and this is super, super quick. I'm going to blast through it. It's a little bit of marketing fluff. And then I'm going to show you Red Hat's implementation of OpenStack. So. I don't need to explain to you guys what OpenStack is, I don't think. Does anyone need a basic explanation? Is anyone brand new to <laughs> John Terpstra, the dude who literally wrote the book on Samba, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, no pressure at all having him in the front row. <laughs> so um, you guys are probably already familiar with the components of OpenStack. You know, you've got everything from uh, uh, compute, the compute networking nodes. You've got image service, object store networking, volume service, identity management with Keystone, and then the dashboard with Horizon. These are the components which we have currently packaged and are part of the Red Hat distribution of OpenStack. And I'll show you what that is. Um, and I, I hear this crap all the time. It's a cloud operating system. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but if that makes your boss happy, then you go with it because, you know, bosses are all driven by trader apps. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of like an OS in that it needs x86 hardware and it uh, needs operating environments, hypervisors, services, and so on. Uh, uses existing code libraries for functionality. OpenStack runs on Linux. Fantastic. Uh, synergy between Linux and OpenStack. They work really well together. It's a fast operating system. It's a cool cloud uh, environment. Red Hat's version of OpenStack is optimized for and integrated with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. <coughs> now, Red Hat has actually been involved in OpenStack since 2011. We did not publicize it because, frankly, we were involved in a bunch of other cloud projects as well. Red Hat fosters and contributes to upstream projects all the time. We try, you know, we don't really make big announcements about it, but we do it all the time. Um, this is kind of an eye chart, so I'm not going to go into all of them except to say that. You know, our very first developer started doing this uh, with Diablo. Um, <clears throat> when Essex released, we were the number three contributor to Essex. We weren't officially part of the OpenStack. Actually, there wasn't even a foundation at that point. Um, when the OpenStack Foundation kicked off at the beginning of this, this year, we were the number two contributor to Folsom. And when Grizzly released, we were actually the number one contributor to Grizzly. A lot of folks don't realize that. We have been very heavily involved in OpenStack for a very long time. We see a ton of value in it. It is absolutely, uh, in our opinion, the, the number one infrastructure as a service offering out there in the open source community. So, you know, we're, we're totally on board. We're committed. Um, this is, again, I talked about this. Number one contributor to Grizzly. And we're one of the eight platinum uh, members of the OpenStack Foundation. As soon as OpenStack became a foundation, as opposed to something that was being run primarily by a commercial entity, we were able to really start um, uh, participating and, and assisting with governance and release models and things like that. So the question is, how do we get from the upstream open source uh, uh, OpenStack distributions to Red Hat's version of OpenStack? And this is a, a fairly important slide, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, if you know anything about Red Hat, you're probably familiar with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, right? That's kind of our flagship. It's the operating system. We've been doing Linux since 93. Everybody knows about Red Hat and Linux. Well, upstream from Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the Fedora Linux distribution and the community that's built around it. So we take all these thousands and thousands and thousands of projects that are out there in the community. Um, they come together in a project like Fedora, and eventually they become Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, we do the same thing for the middleware community. We do the same thing with uh, overt.org, which is our virtualization stack that eventually becomes Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. We do that with bluster.org for storage. That eventually comes Red Hat uh, Storage. And we do the same thing with RDO. And I'll talk more about RDO in a second. But basically, out of the community, the upstream community, we, we uh, created RDO, the Red Hat Distribution of OpenStack, although we don't really call it that. It's a self-referencing uh, acronym like GNU is, which somebody in marketing. But um, so 
RDO is our, our community version, kind of like Fedora is the community version of Linux. And then also down here in the OpenShift world, which is where Adam is from, um, we have OpenShift Origin, which is our platform as a service offering. So, as I said, we, we love the open source community. We contribute a heck of a lot of code to it freely and gladly. Then what we do is we package that in RPM format. We put it out at uh, um, redhat.com slash RDO. I think it's called. No, redhat.com slash OpenStack. Um, <clears throat> it's packaged in the community. It's facilitated by Red Hat. It's really aimed at architects and developers, so you guys are probably uh, great candidates to use RDO. Freely available, not for sale. There's no support around it except for community support. It's a six-month release cadence that mirrors the upstream. The big difference is instead of being all source, it's we package it up. Uh, and it installs on Red Hat and derivative operating systems. So Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Fedora and the respins. Eventually what happens is we get Red Hat, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform. So this is hardened, certified. It has a longer life cycle than six months. Um, we do a six month release cadence, but we offset it by a couple of months. So when Grizzly comes out, or when Havana comes out, I should say, we won't have Red Hat OpenStack Havana for probably two months after the upstream community one uh, comes out because it takes a couple of months for everything to stabilize, to be hardened, to be certified, and basically to make sure that we don't sell a solution that's just busted ass because that happens and people get really, really cranky, so we don't want to do it. Um, so, and that will be supported by Red Hat. <clears throat> The upstream, you guys probably know this, source code only, released every six months, two to three snapshots, including bug fixes. RDO does follow the upstream cadence, but we just package it for Red Hat and derivatives. And then uh, the OpenStack platform, like I said, uh, initially it's going to be a one-year life cycle. We'll eventually put that out to a two-year two life cycle. Um, right now, because it's moving so quickly, because upstream is moving so quickly, it just doesn't make sense for us to try to support it longer than... Uh, one year because nobody's going to keep it production longer than one year. It's, it's quickly. Yes. Um, if if you have a couple month offset from upstream, mm -hmm. how, how do you handle bug fixes? Because those would be more critical to be merged into your problem. Those will be handled asynchronously. Um, so if there is a data corruptor or a security exploit or anything like that, we're not going to say, yeah, you know, you got to wait for a couple of months. When I say it's offset by a couple of months, what I'm saying is when Havana comes out. From the major miles upstream, miles. right, right. It'll probably be about two months before Red Hat's in, uh, version of Havana comes out. But bug fixes and things like that should come out. Very cool. And for the for the year of life cycle, it will have those as well. Right? That's your okay. I don't have phone these days. I don't want to get Cody or anything. Right. So yeah. So uh, bug fixes, especially security related, those are not asynchronously. Uh, so anyway, marketing fluff. Um, and what does a typical OpenStack deployment look like? <laughs> There's not a typical OpenStack deployment, right? Because some customers are like, I have three machines, I want to test this in the lab, and we just had a deal that we can't talk about the customer publicly yet, um, but a very large telco has just done a very large deal with us, and it's going to be, I think the initial run is like hundreds of servers, but we're going to go to like tens of thousands of servers. Um, so what's a typical 10,000 node rollout look like? I don't know. <laughs> haven't done one yet. Let's find out. So, but I mean, basically, the components are designed to be um, uh, modular, and you can run different components on different machines. So um, Keystone and Horizon are typically going to run on the same machine because the Keystone is your identity service, and it kind of manages everything that's going on within your OpenStack environment. And Horizon is the web UI uh, that allows you to manage all of that. But your compute nodes, you can have one or many. So that's you know that's a rack of nodes. And then your image service, object store, and volume service can run on the same boxes, or they can run separately. So it's really just however you want to uh, however you want to deploy it. Now, how many folks have not yet actually installed OpenStack? Is anyone still fairly new, still poking around at it? Okay. So um, this is fairly straightforward. I'm going to blast through it pretty quickly. Um, the big thing to remember about cloud computing in general, whether it's OpenStack or any other cloud computing solution, is you have traditional IT environments where you have these systems of record that are stateful, typically um, authoritative, permanent. They're important. You back them up. You want to make sure that they're there in case of a disaster. 
That is traditional IT. Systems of engagement, as opposed to systems of record, are more like cloud computing. So social business systems, um, things that you're engaging with external customers with, typically are going to be transient and ephemeral. Um, they may come up to take on a workload. If they crash, it doesn't matter. You get rid of it, and then they're going to go down when that workload is done. So as an example, traditional uh, environments, you've got big stateful VMs, you've got Oracle databases or application instances or, or whatever, where if you lose that, you're in trouble. These life cycles are going to be in years. You're going to scale these virtual machines bigger as the load gets bigger. Um, they're not designed to tolerate failures of the VM, so you're going to work really hard to make sure that VM stays up and is healthy all the time. And there are going to be typical, typically uh, strong SLAs around the performance on that machine. Cloud is not like that. Cloud is typically going to be a whole bunch of small stateless VMs. One application may actually go across multiple VMs, or there may be multiple components of an application to a VM. Your life cycles may be as low as hours, as, as high as months, but they're typically impermanent environments. Uh, and your scale is scale out, not scale up. And if a VM dies, eh, doesn't matter. The application in a cloud computing environment should be designed to tolerate such a failure. In fact, when I talk to my customers about, well, how do I re-architect my applications, I say, write your application as if 20% of your nodes are going to fail every year. And they're like, <laughs> but I'm like, hopefully that won't happen. But if it does, you want to be prepared for it. Make it stateless. Make a, you know, put, a, put, your, uh, put your instructions on a message bus so that you've got acknowledgement so that it, you know, when a new machine spins up, it can pick it up and take care of the job. Now, this is not an either or. You don't have to dump traditional and go to cloud. All of my customers, all of my big Fortune 50 customers that I deal with are all doing smaller proofs of concept, except for this big telco, uh, are doing smaller proofs of concept where they may have three nodes or 50 nodes or something fairly small that they're kind of poking it out. And they're going to put their, their cloud stuff out there and start putting DevOps into place, which is a whole other set of challenges. It's an awesome thing to get involved in. And has everyone read Mandatory Reading? Have you read the Phoenix Project? Everybody? Everybody? Good. All right. Um, <laughs> first couple of pages, I was like, really? This is a novel about it. Really? But it, it's good. Um, and I'm sure you guys have all heard the analogy of pets versus cattle. Yeah? I don't need to go over this? Okay, good. I tell this story when I'm up north as a southerner, and I talk about, you know, you got the, you got the, I always use the herd of cattle, right? So you got a herd of cattle, you got 20, 20 ranch hands or you know, cowboys who are riding, you know, 20,000 head of cattle across the and if a cow gets sick, you put a bullet in it and keep going. And I do that up north, and they're all like, oh. <laughs> I'm from Texas. That's how we do things. All right. So uh, if your workloads are cloud-enabled um, and you are ready to build a cloud on Red Hat platform, marketing, marketing, marketing now. Um, I'm gonna, uh, again, I'm going to go past this. If uh, And this, this actually gets into another technology that – if you're interested in cloud management, let me come back and talk to you. But I'm going to break out of this, and I'm going to talk now really about the specifics of Red Hat's OpenStack. So I, uh, I was fortunate to go to um, a technical services conference in Bangkok and deliver a very, very brief overview on essentially for internal technical resources on how to get up and running on uh, Red Hat OpenStack. So I'd like to share that with you guys. Um, this is a very basic installation. This is a very basic explanation. A lot of you guys are probably going to look at this and go, Ugh. but for anyone who's new to OpenStack who hasn't done it before, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I've that I've done to get this to work on my laptop so I can play with it, bang on it, get familiar with it, start to learn the technologies and the concepts without having to have massive data center grade infrastructure that I have to have to do this stuff on. So this is designed to go on a laptop. Now when you build your laptop it can be super simple. Like, you know, when I first did this, I just did a real simple boot, root, and swap. Uh, nothing fancy at all. Very simple installation. Or you can get kind of complicated, which is perfectly fine. Um, you could actually have a separate volume group for sender. It needs to be called sender-volumes. Um, don't put any logical volumes on it. Just create the, the volume group. And then I set up a separate partition or logical volume for Swift as well, and I'll show you what that looks like. So... My kickstart file looks like this. I've got my, you know, boot and swap, and then my root partition, and then I create this directory structure, serve node device one. That's for my first instance of Swift, um, and I created it for my laptop. I don't have a whole lot of space, so I made it 20 gigs. Um, then I created a, 
a uh, physical volume, and then I created a volume group, but I didn't make logical volumes. So that's what I installed on this laptop down underneath. Um, now, you can do a super simple installation of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. When I did my Kickstarter, I just did at base. So it's just the core functionality to get the thing up and running. No graphical user interface. Super, super simple. Um, in my case, I uh, registered my systems with Red Hat Network. If you're going to be doing this off of RHN, then you need to register to the RHEL parent channel, Red Hat Enterprise Linux server, and then also the OpenStack 3.0 child channel. That is Grizzly. Um, Here's what that looks like, and I'm sorry, it's kind of an eye chart because it's a little bit small, but uh, but that's what it looks like on RHN, and when you do yum repo list, you'll see that it's got the Red Hat Enterprise Linux and the Red Hat OpenStack channels. You install the Red Hat installer. The installer that we use to install uh, OpenStack is called PackStack. Anyone work with DevStack? Yeah, same concept, same concept. So the one that we've got is called OpenStack PackStack, so uh, you yum install it. That's what that looks like. And then you can use it to create an answer file. There's actually a number of ways that you can do it. You can pass it a really, really long, nasty, ugly, horrific command line with you know, everything on the command line, or you can put it into an answer file and it will read it off. I like to do the answer file because I'm a horrible typist, and if I try to type out all those command line arguments, it'll take me about seven tries before I don't have a typo in it. So uh, I did uh, packsack dash dash gen dash answer file, and then the name of the file, called it packsack answer.txt. The changes that I made for doing a alone, just like an all-in-one on your laptop, um, are that uh, I did make sure that I installed Glance, uh, which is your uh, uh, catalog and repository for virtual disk images. Um, you want to make sure that that's turned on. Uh, also, Cinder, you want to make sure that that's turned on as well. Um, this is volume management. This is the default. To, uh, it, is, it is turned on by default. If you want to have kind of the equivalent of Amazon uh, EBS, Elastic Block Storage, um, then you want to turn on uh, Nova as well, so you can make sure that that's uh, on. Now, anyone work with Neutron? Got the scars to prove it, right? Yeah. For an all-in-one on a laptop, I recommend against turning on Neutron. Just do regular Nova networking. Neutron is really cool. And it's very flexible, and it allows you to set up VLANs, so you can have VLANs between physical hosts, or to do GRE encapsulation, which is a really cool way of doing networking without having to, to set up VLANs. Um, for a standalone instance on a laptop, totally unnecessary, and will actually complicate things to the point where it gets kind of frustrating. So I, I say to turn it off for a standalone. Um, make sure that Horizon is installed unless you want to do everything from the command line, and that's perfectly reasonable. You can do everything from the command line. Um, I like to have a graphical user interface because it makes for much better demos. Trying to do a demo of something in front of a room full of folks and going, here, I'm going to type this. Not terribly sexy. So. Now, here's one that, uh, that you do want to change, or you may potentially want to change, I should say. Um, the object store or Swift. It provides for storage, object and uh, yeah, object storage uh, in your OpenStack environment. So you want to make sure that that's turned on if you want it. Um, if yeah, one of the things to remember is that you can put this on a dedicated partition. That's what I did in that second example of the Kickstart file, the partitioning section of the Kickstart file. Um, I do that. I prefer to do that. If you don't do that, then it will uh, it'll actually create a loopback file, which is great for demos. Don't try to use it in production. It's it'd be slow. Does it change the number of replicas automatically? <coughs> By default, it does single. It doesn't do any replicas because we're doing a one-on-one. -on -one. If you did you is that based on Packstack? We'll do that by default, or is that because you did a gen and you're doing a standalone? Um, Packstack, Packstack by default, well, no. Packstack by default will prompt you. If you don't have an answer file, if you just do Packstack and hit enter, it'll ask you. Yeah, it'll prompt you for the number of replicas and where you want to put them, and you can actually go out. You can get super, super complex with Packstack. Um, uh, and, and actually, it's, it's kind of funny because you know how developers are, right? Oh, I wouldn't use that thing. I'm going to do it all myself. I'm going to code it. And those of us who are in the field, who just need to roll this stuff out quickly. I'm like, Packstack's great. So it's really funny because some folks are like, oh, I've never used Packstack. And those of us who are in the field are like, I want to get this thing rolled out quickly. Packstack works pretty well. And in the answer file, you can actually do things like put multiple servers. And so you can say, I want these four machines to be my compute nodes, and I want to put, you know, Swift on these nodes. I mean, you can, you can get pretty complex. I, I played with it at 1.0, mm -hmm. and Packstack wouldn't let you run more than once. 
That's been fixed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's more fact, stable. I mean, be quite great. And yeah. if you wanted to eventually turn this into a multi node, you could yes. just rerun. Yeah, it's actually really easy. <laughs> um, in fact, if you look at the docs at RDO, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, stream, um, the instructions there, the quick start is basically what I'm describing right here. And then the very bottom of the quick start is, and if you want to do uh, multiple, here's how to do it. It just says you go back and you edit the, uh, the file and add additional servers, you run it again, and it'll go log into those systems and install. Yeah, right. The first Yeah, yeah. And the answer file that it that it does, like if you spend a lot of time kind of sweating through all the details and figuring it out, it's really nice because now you've got an answer file and you can rerun it multiple times. In fact, I'll show you how to do that just now. <coughs> Um, all right, so, and then do you want to have the administrative tools, the command line administrative tools, including the RC file that sets environment variables? I always say yes, because there are some things, especially if you are doing neutron networking, which absolutely have to be done from the command line. You can't do it through Horizon. Um, comma separated list of time servers. <laughs> Make sure your time is right. You will have a very bad day if your systems are really significantly off in time, uh, because they saw, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll just get all kinds of flaky results. I've had things like, you know, VM just wouldn't start because it was waiting for the time to match what was on the other machine, but they were off by like five minutes. I'm sitting there pulling my hair out, trying to figure out why the hell this thing won't start. I'm sure we will. I don't know of a roadmap time frame. Um, have you filed a bug on that? Can you please? Can you please? Community. <laughs> All right. Um, and then also, if you want to uh, do an installation of Nagios to monitor your environment, you can just say yes here, and it'll actually go through and set up Nagios for you as well. So um, for each one of the following services, you can actually define the host upon which the service will run. So you can get, you can actually get very very complex. You can actually install services across multiple uh, physical systems. But uh, Cupid for messaging, uh, AMQP for, for messaging, <laughs> Keystone Identity Management, Glance, Sender, Nova, etc. Those are all available to be installed on multiple machines. This is what that looks like. Now, because I'm doing this all on one machine, all of these services are all running on the same IP address. But in a lot of cases, um, like you've got Swift storage hosts. Anytime you see uh, plural where it says hosts, you can actually do comma comment delimited uh, and install on multiple machines. How about that MySQL? Are you doing the, are you going to use Protosync PageMaker stack to make that redundant or how are you going to do that? So I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure what the, what the target is for Havana. Um, there's been a lot of talk about maybe we just use internal MySQL replication so we can have multiple instances versus doing something like Corosync. Um, I don't know what the final solution is going to be, but we are aware that it's a spot. When you right do on. RHO, mm -hmm. what, what do you, I mean, your, your production right had open stack. Okay, okay. folks doing RHOS, but yeah, RHOS, okay. Um, what, are, <laughs> what are you seeing customers do? Because obviously that's, everybody has seen that as a single point of failure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've seen everything from just make sure you have really good backups. I know. Um, to we're just going to go with it. To I've I've seen people talking about MySQL replication, just using MySQL's native replication. Um, there's not a there's not a clear standard yet. That's you know OpenStack is really cool, but it's still got a lot of sharp edges, um, and it's it's really still a very niche product. Like everyone that I talk to is interested in it. But then when I show them what some of the limitations are, and I do the, the pets versus cattle analogy, I really freak out about shooting a cow. They're like, oh, you mean I can't put Oracle on this? Like, it's not a replacement for VMware? And so then you have to have that whole conversation again and say you really need to understand this is an environment that is actually kind of designed for failure. I know that sounds crazy, but you're not going to put big Oracle da databases on no, you can build it. You can. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you can, but the design goal originally and actually kind of how it's progressing, that's all stuff that, that people are putting on after the fact, and that's perfectly acceptable. I mean, I hope I mean, I hope that it does become something that you can just... What's up? I can, I can go bad. and tell my customers, like, here's the Red Hat OpenStack mug. 
Just put that on your desk when the VMware dude comes out. I've been here. Just want to watch. Um, that actually brings up another really good question about other hypervisors supporting those other problems. Upstream supports, geez, Zen and KVM and Hyper V and ESX. Are you guys going to support any of those inside the Red Hat OpenStack? We support KVM. KVM. Only KVM. We support KVM. Yeah. yeah. Now, RDO, I'm not sure. Because there's, and, and what I mean by that is I'm not sure where our support is no support, but I'm not sure what the supported environment for RDO is going to be. There's a lot of talk um, about maybe extending it, but I'll be honest with you. <laughs> yep. Yep. But they don't use our... I don't think we have a plug-in for Hyper-V in RDO. To the we, open stack meetup tonight. Not that I'm aware of. Installer, so if you're using RDO, you can use the Cloud-based installer to connect hyper what's that? Okay. The open stack meetup. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff going out there upstream, or there's a lot of stuff going on in the, in the community. We will only support our platforms. But if you want other platforms, I strongly encourage you to open a Bugzilla. Like, I really, really encourage you to open a Bugzilla if there are other platforms you want. Because we don't know that that's valuable unless customers tell us. So, I personally would like to see this in more other platforms. I did not say that. You did not hear that. Don't tell me when I said it. I'll tell you that. Something like LXD or Totally agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. Reach into the choir. Open a Bugzilla. I didn't say that. None of you heard. These are not the droids you're looking for. Really? So, I'm sorry? Really? So, you can do like a. Do it in a VM, spin it up in and actually spin VMs on the Yeah, you could. Uh, well, I know community. I know upstream can. I don't. I don't know if you would not do that in. I don't know. Yeah, I mean it's 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 core. It's yeah, yeah. I mean yes, we're using QEMU for sure. But as far as like, uh, are you talking about doing things like nested virtualization? Yes. Okay. So you can do that in Fedora 19 or Fedora 20. Um, you can't do it on Rel yet. Uh, actually, you won't be able to do it on Rel until Rel 7. Um, they're not going to backport that functionality. What's that? When it's yes. Ready. When it's ready. How about 6.5? Uh, it just went beta yesterday, day before yesterday. So it's in beta. We usually do beta for four to six weeks. So soonish. Four to six weeks? Four to six. <laughs> 46 weeks. You don't mind a four year turnaround, do you? On beta? It's the longest beta in the world next to Kim. I'm going to talk to you later about that. Yeah, yeah. Using Docker? That's we Docker. had the uh, last uh, meetup. Oh, yeah, Docker. yeah, okay. Well, you just mentioned Docker, and we recently had an announcement that uh, OpenShift and Docker are doing partnership. Yeah, so uh, Docker is awesome. Um, so, anyway, this is what it winds up looking like. Um, you can set passwords for all of these various services. If you don't want to set a password, just let the uh, pack stack generate one. Um, you know, pretty good passwords. They're long and complicated. Um, now, if you did not create a volume group for sender, you can let Packstack create one. And the way that you do that is you just leave that as create uh, sender volume set to yes. If you created your own, then set that to no. Um, if you're going to let it create it, set the size. Otherwise, just whatever the size of the volume you created was. If you did set yours up, make sure you set that to no. Um, for the the flat, uh, this, this, the terminology with OpenStack really kind of irritates me. Um, there are two networks that you need to be aware of. For, for anyone who hadn't installed yet, there's two networks that you need to be aware of at minimum. There's the internal private network. If, you're, if you've used Amazon EC2, you know how when you spin a virtual machine up, it's actually got IP addresses that are RFC 1918, like not public addresses. We do the same thing. OpenStack does the same thing. There's a private network that you can't get to from the outside. Um, you need to be able to serve DHCP for that network, and you need to bind DHCP to an interface. For an all-in-one, you can use the loopback interface. It even works most of the time. Um, but sometimes I've actually run into weird issues where um, in, in an all-in-one, I spin up a VM, and it picks up an address from an external DHCP server if I'm binding to the loopback. I'm not sure how that works, but it does, and it's kind of bad. So be aware that that might happen. Yes, that was actually was a bug in my because it was it got fixed recently. Like, oh, good. Okay, two weeks ago. Ah, okay, awesome. I've been on the road solid for two weeks. We were we were waiting for it in OpenShift. Yeah, we have we have a proxy thing. I'll tell you about later. 
yeah, it was really cool doing a live demo in front of a group bigger than this. I'm like, and you'll see that the virtual machine comes up. Crap, wrong address. Hang on just a second. Yeah. So these slide videos. What's that? You post these slide videos. People.redhat.com slash T Cameron. And I'll put that up at the end. Um, I will give out business cards and my my people pages on there as well. So so anyway, uh, that's what, that's out there. So that's that internal network. You can set the range, set the CIDR, so set the subnet mask. I, I actually bring it down a little bit because it does like this massive 2048 node or 2048 address space. I crank it back down to a class C CIDR. Now there's another network that you need to be aware of, and that is your public network. Now it's confusing because I'm using private IP addresses for my public network, but this is, you know, when you're in a lab environment or you're behind behind the firewall, it's probably gonna be the case. Now the thing that that is odd about the way that you define that public network is you need to use CIDR to define it. Um, so if your system, for instance, is, is 172.31.100.50 with a 24-bit net mask, and your DHCP server is handing out from 50 to 100, then the floating IP address range, which is the addresses that will be passed through from the public network back to those private networks in the, in the virtual machines, um, you want to put those in a different range from what's being handed out to your physical machines. Does that make sense? Because if you're mapping addresses, you get IP conflicts and you'll have a bad day and somebody from IT will call you and you don't want that. Um, so um, I set the floating IP address range, for instance, 172.31.100.159 slash 27. So I, I carved my subnet down into a range of um, only, what was it? I think I did 32, yeah. Or did I do 64? I did 32. Yeah. So, um, so I got 32 addresses that are available to be passed through to the private IP addresses on the machines. And the way that you do that again is you say my floating range is blah blah blah, and you got to put that that slash whatever you're doing to, to set the range. Mm -hmm. Now, this one can also be a little bit confusing. If you didn't set up a separate partition or logical volume for Swift, then just leave this section as is. It'll auto-populate what the storage host is, and if you don't have anything at the end of that IP address, it'll go, I'm gonna create a loopback device, and I'm gonna mount it, and I'm gonna make that my Swift storage. And that's perfectly fine. If you're doing it on a single laptop and you're just showing it off, not a problem. If you want a little bit better performance, what you can do is, you can say, there's the IP address, slash the device as it exists, under slash dev. So don't put slash dev slash sdv1, just put slash sdv1. Or if you're using um, if you're using volume groups, then it would be slash vg my computer slash lv my lv. Okay? But just leave the dev part out of it. Um, you can pretty much leave the rest of it alone um, in this example because we're using Red Hat's OpenStack distribution. You don't need to enable EPEL. Extra packages for Enterprise Linux, um, which is the Fedora project for packages for RHEL and CentOS and Scientific and all those other respins. Um, so, and then you can leave the rest of it pretty much alone. The rest of it has to do with whether or not you're registered to RHN. Uh, so I'm assuming that you are registered to RHN when you do this because you're doing it on RHEL. And then when you're done, packstack dash dash answer file equals slash root slash packstack dash answer dot text. It will run through, and actually that reminds me, hold on just a second. While we're waiting, or while we're uh, doing this, um, I'm going to do exactly what we just said. I've got the answer file, and I've filled it all out, and I've put all my IP addresses and stuff like that. This is going to take a little while, so what I'm going to do is hacksack, oops, yum-y install, openstack-packstack. And this is running on this little laptop down here. So I'll do pack stack dash dash answer dash file equals answers.txt. Yep. Oh, typo. Thank you. Yeah. I love live demos. Absolutely love it. Oh, answer. God, someday I'm going to learn how to type. And I've only been doing this for 20 years. There we go. All right, so it's going to ask me for the root password. I'm going to put that in. All right, so it's going to run through. Let me get back over into the slides because this does take a little while, and I want to blast through this as quickly as possible. 
Is it automatically set up passwordless SSH, or is that just for your backup? That's what it prompted me for that password for. It actually SSH into itself, and it generated the key at the same time. The oh, password. that wasn't, uh, oh, yeah. You're not, you don't have multiple hosts. You weren't yeah. writing the password for the remote host. You're doing local. For local, yeah. yeah. It does everything the same. It SSHs at the local host. If I had specified multiple machines, it would let SSH into those two. If I had specified 10 hosts, it would have, I would have been prompted. Or if you were running this from a client or a workstation, a management server, you would be it would be, yeah, it'd be a done deal. Now, you can, in the answer file, actually point to the, the um, PEM file or the, the uh, IDRSA.pub or DSA.pub, whichever one you want to use. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's running. Let me, let me go back into the slides real quick. All right, so, so what a wind-up hat. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Hold on. That file right there. Start right there. Oh man, why did it start the very beginning? Hang on. Love like demos, don't you? I love like demos. Also running Alpha. Yeah, I'm also running Fedora 20 Alpha. I noticed the I do both wallpapers. Yeah, did you notice? <laughs> yeah, it's a little, it's a little exciting sometimes. I was gonna run Paxac on this machine, and it burst into flames. And I went, so I'm going to bring a second laptop with me and show them on the RHEL 6.4 laptop. So, so this is what it looks like, right? So you go through, and it'll ask you for the passwords for each one of the machines. Um, it'll go through, and it'll run through all these Puppet jobs. And we use Puppet. Um, it goes through, and it runs all these Puppet manifests, installs the appropriate RPMs, um, makes all the settings, pokes all the entries into the uh, MySQL database. You know, it, does, it builds the tables and then dumps information into them, sets up all the networking. It'll actually install uh, a newer kernel. If you're running World 6.4, it'll run a, it'll install an OpenStack kernel that includes the um, capacity to do GRE tunnels, uh, which we're not using. We didn't define uh, Neutron or Quantum is what it's called here, but it's actually been updated to Neutron. So we won't have any of that stuff on there. But eventually what winds up happening is you get a screen that looks like this. And it'll say, we're completed. Your, um, your RC file, which is where all your like uh, administrative password and the URLs to, to make REST API calls to manage the system are in that RC file. And then it'll set up your Nagios information. And you may get a message that looks like this. Hey, a kernel package with net namespace support has been installed. You need to reboot. Um, so you reboot if that's the case. And then, as we mentioned, it, uh, it saves the setup log file, and it does create an answer file if you just ran it from the command line and got prompted. It's really, really a very smart uh, installer. So when you get done, you can look in the Keystone RC admin file, and you'll see the administrator password right there. And it's one of these random crazy strings, unless you went in and changed it. So you then open up a web browser, go to the machine, and you fill in admin and that password. There are a couple of steps that you need to take uh, to get your environment finished up. You need to upload a system image. Now, we've got a RHEL 6.4 system image on our HN. It's really easy to find. If you go and you click on the downloads page for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you click on the little plus next to RHEL, and there's a, a link there that you can go and download the image file. Or you can go to fedoraproject.org and grab a Fedora image. I mean, there's a ton of images out there um, for virtualization, for KVM virtualization, uh, and you can use any of them. Um, for If you do it off of RHN, that's what it looks like. There's a KVM guest image. You can download it. And then what you're going to do is, in the web UI, you're going to go click on the project and choose images and choose create image. So click on project, choose images and snapshots, click on the button that says create image. You're going to populate this box, give it a name, uh, and that's the name of the image. Remember that that image is going to be used to spawn up multiple instances. So I generally recommend you give it kind of a generic name. I call it rel 6 qcow 2 Give it the path to the image, the format of the image, and go to town. You can leave these alone, the minimum disk and minimum RAM. Uh, RAM. The one thing you do want to do is make sure you check the box that says this is a public image. That means that anyone who logs into the interface that's got an account can use this image to spin up a, a guest. When you do that, it actually stores it. Remember, Glance is image storage. So if you look under bar lib Glance images, there's a funky named file in there. If you run file against it, you can see it's a QEMU image. So when you upload your image, it gets stored in Glance storage. Uh, after a few minutes, you'll see that it's active and it's ready to go. Now, one of the things that, uh, that, that actually when I first started playing around with this was, and I forgot to do this, I forgot to create a, a key pair. Um, and so I spun the machine up, and I went to the console, and I'm like, what's the password? 
because it's a pre-built machine. And I'm like bugging people inside a Red Hat, you know, what's the password? And they're like, you haven't done this before, have you? Oh, key pair. We set up key pairs, and actually what's cool is when we launch this image, um, we actually use Lib LibGuestFS to poke the key pair into it. So we actually mount the image, poke in the SSH keys. So you need to create a pair of SSH keys, and the way that you do that is go into Project Access and Security Key Pairs, and then choose Create a Key Pair. Give it a name, anything you want, um, and it'll save a PIM file to your local file system. I generally store mine under .ssh, just so I know where it is, since I'm going to be using it for SSH, so you can store it anywhere. Um, you'll need to change permissions on it later on. We'll talk about that then. So now that we've defined access for SSH, and we've uh, defined what our VM image looks like, we can go spin up an instance. And the way that we do that is you go into, actually, you go into projects, instances, and choose launch instance. You'll be presented with the dialog box that gives you a couple of options. You want to do? You want to launch an instance from an image file or from a snapshot? Don't have time to go into snapshots because I don't want to keep you guys super super late. Um, give it a name, a friendly name that you're going to recognize, and then you can choose the flavor. And we have you know small, medium, large flavors, just like every other cloud solution out there. And an instance count: how many of them do I want to spin up? Um, I do also need to go to access and security, which is that tab right there, and make sure that the correct key pair is uh, defined in there. Um, once you've selected the right key pair, you don't have to do anything else. You can do some fancy stuff like set this thing up to be backed by a volume, a persistent volume, but, but that's a little bit more advanced use. So I would say hit launch, and when you do, you're going to get a screen that looks like this. You'll see that it's in progress. It'll take a little while to come up, and after it comes up, you'll see that it is active. Status is active. Remember we talked about how there are two IP addresses, right? There's one that's the private VM network, and then there's one that's public. You'll know that right now, it only has the one private IP address. You cannot get to this VM from outside uh, of the, of the uh, machine. So the next thing that you want to do is just make sure that it came up cleanly and it booted correctly. The way that you do that is you go into the console to make sure that it booted up. So you go to the machine, you click the drop down right there and choose console, and you'll see Ah, I've got a machine. I've got a virtual machine. Crazy thing about this, and I don't know if the upstream open stack is like this, you can't type in this console. You can send a control or delete, but like on every instance that I've done, you can't type here. You actually have to go back. Or actually, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? You have to do something crazy. You have to click the link that says show only the console. Then it passes through keystrokes. I don't know if that's a bug or if it does it in upstream. Does it do it upstream as well? Okay, good. Because I was sitting there going, to the VNC thing. Is that, okay, is that, so this is not a full VNC session, it's just display only? Oh, no VNC session. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's the ah, extraction of VNC. Okay, yeah, I felt like an idiot. I was sitting there like, what am I doing wrong? All right, so now you've got the machine up, that's great, but it can't do anything yet, or at least you can't get to it from the outside yet. So you can associate a floating IP address. Remember, we defined that range of floating IP addresses. And the way that you do that is you click on the instance and you choose Associate Floating IP. Now, one thing to be aware of, because we're using Nova networking, because this is a really, really simple installation, when you choose Associate a Floating IP, it's going to go, OK, I'm associating the next one available. You don't have any choice as to what it is or anything like that. It's just going to assign the next one available. If you do more advanced networking, neutron networking, you can actually get really granular as to how you want to do it and what you want to assign and some, some pretty cool stuff like that. But again, this is really just kind of a quick demo of how that stuff all works. So when I click on OK, it just grabs the next available one. So I've got the 172.31. The 172.31 is my public address that gets passed through to the private. I did this the first time, and again, you know, tinkering, tinkering around. I'm like, OK, I've got an IP address, and I tried to SSH in. Nothing happened. I got a permission or a, 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 a no route to host. Just like with Amazon, you have to allow you have to open up ports to go from the public address to the private address. The mapping is there, but there's no ports that are opened up. And so the way that you do that is fairly straightforward. You go into the uh, project, go to Access and Security, click on Security Groups. You can either add a new group, or you can just edit the existing one. There's really good arguments on both sides of the house as to whether you should edit the existing one or add a new one. I'm not going to fight that fight. You do whatever you want. So in this case, I chose Add a Rule. And it's fairly straightforward. I go and I choose the protocol, TCP or, or uh, UDP, or even ICMP. There's all kinds of protocols there. Choose the port, 
and then choose how you're going to define the source. Are you going to do it from an individual host, or are you going to do a subnet or a network? In this case, you choose CIDR and just do 0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0, and that says, I'm opening up port 22 TCP from anywhere to this instance. So you do that, and it'll come back and it'll say, okay, we added the, the rule. You can also do things like set a range. So you can, like, say, if you're going to do remote X or VNC display or something crazy like that, you can say from 5,900 to 6,100 or something. You can do ranges as well. Doesn't the security go back to function on the private line? Does it also protect yeah. tenants from each other? Yes. Right. Yes. So the, 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 public, the, the public IP is just a... It's just passing line. through. Right. Right. Did I say differently? Yeah, I think you said it was on the private so My this. apologies. I, I that was incorrect if I said I that. Wrong or, yeah. No, I spoke incorrectly. Thank you. Uh, so yes, that is correct. So, but the like some some people or sometimes what I wind up doing is if I'm like I'm going to do IP tables rules, I'll just say open up from one to sixty five five thirty five, which is actually kind of stupid, but. If you're not running NFS and you're not running anything else as network listening, then you can, instead of having two layers of security, you can do everything with IP tables rules. But yes, you are correct. That's actually on the guest itself. All right, so now we're going to SSH in. We've opened up port 22, so we're going to SSH in. Remember that SSH is real cranky about permissions for uh, PIM files, so you got to do chmod 600 on it. Uh, and then you can do SSH root at hostname or SSH cloud dash user at hostname. They both work, and I was under the impression that you weren't supposed to be able to SSH in as root, or it was supposed to be a separate, but it works. It works for root or cloud user. That's your image. Yeah, that's yeah. basically, yeah, it's, it's, it's what the image, but see, I thought that our image was hardened, and I'm, so I've been bugging the guys on the RDO group, and I'm like, you're supposed to be able to Actually, RDO only works with root right now. The cloud, yeah, that's right. The cloud user is busted right now. The cloud user setup is there's something broken about it. You know, do you remember what it was? Uh, just, uh, there's three steps to install RDO. The first one is allow Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So then you can get into some of the fancier stuff, like add a volume. So you can attach a volume, like similar to uh, Amazon EBS. And the way that you do that is you go into uh, project, go to volumes, and choose create a volume. And it's real simple. Um, you just go in and choose the size. So give it a name, give it a type, and give it the size. And actually, you don't even need to give it a type. Just leave it, leave it blank. So I created a 5 gig volume and clicked on create volume. And it'll, it'll show that it's working for a little while because it's actually carving out that volume. And it's carving that volume out of the sitter volumes um, volume group. Uh, and then when you get done, It'll be done. It'll it'll show that it's available, and you can choose edit attachments. Uh, then when you do that, you, it's fairly straightforward. When you click on edit attachments, you'll have a list of machines that you can attach it to, and then you can tell it what device name you want to give it, and it, it will ignore it because it will give it the next device that's available. It'll be dev vd whatever the next uh, block whatever the next disk is available. Uh, so, and when you get done, it'll take a few seconds. It'll show that it's attaching, and eventually it'll say that it has attached. So it is attached on slash dev slash VDC. Ignore that. It'll just be whatever the next block device that's available is. And if you go and look at the console, you'll see all of the, the traffic that gets flashed out to the screen saying, hey, I got a new block device, and I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, it is stored under sender volumes volume group. So if you go and you do uh, LV display, you'll see this really crazy um, UUID name that's assigned to that volume. But this is pers uh, this is uh, persistent. So if your machine crashes and needs to go away, you can bring up another machine and attach it to that machine. So super, super simple installation. Very, very basic. Uh, it ran a little bit longer than I intended to. I think how later how late are y'all willing to stay? Because I've got a I can show you a demo of it if you want to. That would, yeah, okay, cool. All right, cool. So, um, very briefly, my email address is up there. I'm really easy to reach. I am Thomas at redhat.com. I've been here for a while. Um, so, if you got any questions, don't hesitate to do that. I've got my uh, business cards also. I'll get those out. Let's break out of the slide deck. Yeah, people.redhat.com slash T Cameron. C. And, and seriously, I got business card. I got stacks of business cards. It's on there. So if you want the slide deck, come up and get a business card. Oh, gosh, you know what? I've been a bad, bad host. 
You asked a good question? Oh, somebody else, somebody over here. Somebody else was asking questions. Yeah, come here. <laughs> I'll start chucking these. What, somebody called this a church key. I like that. It's, it's a, uh, these are um, OpenShift, not OpenStack, OpenShift USB keys. Uh, they're four gig USB keys, and they're also bottle openers. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas at redhat.com. Yeah, thank you. And the, the people one was people.redhat.com. Here. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I'm not people. Sure <laughs> All right. So um, if you look up on the screen, oh. <laughs> please don't put customer eyes out. <laughs> Nobody's been hospitalized yet. Yeah, I'm going to walk back here. <laughs> so. Um, so on the machine, this machine down here, it got done, and, uh, and it said um, that it installed successfully and it kept the log file. Now, it did install a newer kernel. For some reason, with this latest spin of Red Hat OpenStack, we're not getting the message that says you need to reboot, but you do need to reboot because it does install the kernel that does network namespaces. So I'm going to reboot real quick. What does it use networking namespaces for? Oh, network namespaces is awesome. Um, it doesn't use it for Nova networking, but um, if you have quantum or neutron, as it's called now, network namespaces is really cool. It'll actually um, allow you to do some really neat things, like when you're defining tenant networks or networks for, for different uh, organizations within your OpenStack installation, um, you can actually assign out, like, 192.168.0.0 slash 24 to separate customers, and the network namespace capabilities in newer kernels will actually totally work with that. It'll, it'll allow that to work. Um, does it, it, I think it, NetNS requires VLAN and not GRE, or VLAN and, uh, will it do VLAN and GRE both? I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but essentially what it does is it'll use VLANs to, to be able to set up multiple um, identical network namespaces, and so that way, if you're templating stuff, if you want to script, or if you want to code something to just kick out a new subnet or kick out a new network namespace for a new customer, you're not having to do customization for every customer. You do the same thing, same template over and over and over and over again, and the kernel actually understands that and will encapsulate that traffic so even, even cross-domain uh, or namespace traffic works. It's pretty crazy, but it's very cool. Let's see if we came back up. I think this thing will boot with the lid closed. So we'll find out. <laughs> Uh, does Synchron include support for SDN enabled routers as well, or is it just you the uh, virtual interface only? Say again, I'm sorry? Uh, so software configurable routers? Right. Does it have, uh, provide support for that, or is it just accomplishing everything through the virtual interface? Everything that we're doing right now is using is using internal networking or open vSwitch. So if you have hardware that does, like that's open, or not open vSwitch, but SDN yeah. capable, I don't believe that we have anything that talks to those routers because um, we've we've really tried to make it so that it, everything is self-contained in software. Right. So is, you, it, is there any way to uh, extend that? Uh, Patch is cheerfully accepted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's open source. So. Yeah. so it's probably rebuilding the uh, the K dump kernel. So give me just a second. Hopefully it is booting out. Yeah. Sorry. Come on. So, well, so I quick question. Yeah. Um, I know I use, I use Viper a lot to mm -hmm. spin up uh, web environments, especially for the <laughs> environments and testing. Mm -hmm. Red right. Hat have you gotten really <laughs> big images that I can use on the box? Not that I know of. I have not heard any about that. We're doing. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I honestly don't don't even know that much about Vagrant, but it hasn't. I haven't seen a lot of traffic about it on the internal OpenStack lists, so I know of no plans to make that work. But and I don't the know other thing, everything you've done here, I assume, without having a, without having a <laughs> I guess can I do this without having for real? Like really? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> um, you can sign up for emails. You can absolutely sign up for any eval. We'll do a zero, zero, zero notes. Right. What's that? It's three notes. You're limited to. I think so. That sounds right. Um, uh, will it work on CentOS? <laughs> RDO will work on CentOS. Right. So I guess my better question is can I do it without a subscription to RHM? Um, so on this machine that I actually just did right here, 
I actually sync through repos locally because I wasn't sure if I'd have Wi-Fi. Absolutely, you need a repo, um, and you can you can sync the RDO repo to anything. It'll work on CentOS or Scientific or Red Hat Enterprise or you know any other respins or anything like that. Um, come on, love live demos. Hang on a second, Let me do this. Um, so yes, in theory, that should it should work on anything. Um, Packstack uses Apple. Uh, extra packages for, or no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, scratch that. Um, Packstack, why are we not working for SSH? Oh, you know what? I think I'm connected to the Wi Fi network at the same time, and I think that it just changed the default route. Sorry, guys, one second. Yeah, so when this thing rebooted, the interface went down. So hang on a second. Hey, look at that. I'm in. Don't go to sleep. Here. All right. So basically, what's happened now is um, my instance of OpenStack is up and running. Um, I'm not getting any. Oh, yes, I am. I'm getting screaming error messages. I have yet to figure out how to make this work uh, using Paxact. This is a bug that I've actually already reported. You remember I talked about how I created the, the partition and I mounted it under slash serve slash blah, 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 blah. If I do this, okay, that's owned by Swift, but that's owned by root. I have yet to figure out why that happens. It's, it's not setting permissions the correct way. So what I need to do is Chown Swift colon Swift. This one. And honestly, I'm going to reboot because I've, I've tried to restart Swift services and there's like 18 bazillion of them. What's going to be doing Swift Jet right now, though? What's that? What's going to be doing Swift Jet? I have no idea. I haven't figured that out yet. I don't know. We haven't set up anything to use Swift Jet. I know. I know, but it, it happens. I think it's actually because um, when the web interface comes up, when Horizon comes up, it shows oh, yeah. probes everything. And that's what that 503 error is, because that's actually an, uh, a... Was that IP, your IP? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to give this just a second to boot up. Um, and i, I got to figure out why that is. I've actually thought about trying to do Packstack within a script so that at the end it actually sets it. But... but yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm watching it. So still up. Okay, that's booting. Yeah, I see um, you mentioned it uses Puppet, Packstack uses Puppet to do everything. Does it leave any footprint of Puppet there? It doesn't have any Puppet Master set up or anything? No, it doesn't. It, it's not supposed to, but it does keep a log of all the installations. But it's only a log. It doesn't, doesn't leave any infrastructure in place. Okay, so... Nope. Nope, it's a super, super simple... It just uses Puppet services. Yeah, it's it's not setting up a puppet infrastructure. Okay, so it looks like we're good there. All right, cool. So now, again, what you guys saw me do already, um, I'm just going to do again. Uh, let me get the web browser over to this screen right here. So I'll go to host 237.tc.redhat.com. I like typing over my shoulder. Oh, come on. All right, so there we go. There is admin, and now remember we talked about that RC file, um, that uh, uh, Keystone RC. If I cat the Keystone RC file. There is the password that I need. I am going to save the password, and that's it. I mean, all the things that I did in the screenshots. 
I'm absolutely happy to go over them all over again and, and you know live, and I'm, I'm relatively certain that they'll work. Um, since I had a, a little screw up with the permissions, every once in a while I'll see something flaky come out of it. But really, I mean, uh, like I said, all you need to do at this point is start with uh, uh, uploading your image. So I'm going to go to images and snapshots, create an image. I'll call it my REL6 QCAL2 image. I can either give it a URL or I can give it a, uh, uh, I can browse on the file system. I happen to have one under there. There you go. And then I'm going to tell it what format it is, QCAL2, make sure that it's set as public so anyone can use it. Scroll down and then choose create image. And at this point it's going to upload that image. And Do what? You got a lot of Swift proxy instances. Yeah, that's just uh, that's where it started. I don't know. In such a weird order. And there's my uh, there's my image file. Again, if I run file against that, it'll come. Oops. There we go. It'll come back, and it says there it is. It's a QEMU image. So, and you notice that in the background it says success. So now I've got that image file up there. So the next thing that I want to do, well, there's a couple of things that I could do at this point. I'm going to go ahead and set up my key pairs just for giggles. So I'll set up a create a key pair, and I'll call this the T Cameron key. And when I create that, it'll download it. So I'll save that to my .ssh directory. Do you have an option to upload your own? Yeah, you absolutely do. You absolutely do. I'm going to save that to T Kim and Key Pen. I guess I'll replace that. Um, yeah, you do. If you go over here into Access and Security, go to Key Pairs. You can import a key pair. So if you have a if you have a key pair that you already use, that works just fine. You can upload it as well. That's fine. Um, and then I'm also going to go ahead and uh, I'm just going to edit the existing security groups. I know it makes sense to, to build one, put a new one in place. That's perfectly acceptable. But for now, I'm just going to say I'm going to allow TCP. Uh, port 22 to connect from anywhere. So click on add. Uh, if I wanted to do web services, I'd do 80 and 443, but all that stuff's good. Um, so now I'm going to go to instances and I'm going to say launch an instance. So I'm going to do it as an image. Uh, I'll use my rel QCAL image. I'll call this one uh, TC rel 61. Scroll down and say launch. And it'll take a few minutes, and you see that it's building the image. And remember, at this point, it's actually using libguestfs to poke that key pair into the .ssh directory, into root home directory, and slash home slash cloud dash user. It'll take a few minutes, and while that's happening, aha, now we have an objects directory. Oh, it built that stuff out. Why didn't you put anything in? Should have built. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll give it a few minutes. Uh, you can, while this thing's running, you can. Uh, well, actually, you can't do anything right right now. While it's still building. There's no objects. Yeah, I know. I hadn't built the objects yet. So. <clears throat> it's about as much fun as watching paint dry. That, that was your switch. <coughs> right. Yeah, I, I'm not there yet. Yeah, I'm not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you have to to be Google. Yes. Hang on just a second. As soon as it comes up, I'll show you. If actually you, you have to have allowed ICMP if you want to do ping. And actually, while that's happening, let's do that because, again, this is. Oh, there it goes. You can ping out. Yeah, you should be able to ping out. Yeah, there's no out. But if you want to allow, if you want to ping back in, um, then I do minus one because I, I think it's silly to block ICMP. I, I guess I think your question is more uh, are you routing out your fixed network? Yes. Okay. So when you set that up on that box, when um, or does Packstack create a uh, a bridge for this host and assign it an IP and then turn it into a router? Hang on just a second. I'll show you. Oops. Say again. 
Well, I guess what interface is, is has the route? Is it the public one or is it on fixed? It'll it'll uh, actually it should go out through the through the public interface. Hang on a second. Uh, it spins up a bridge for you based on what what or it defines a bridge for you based on what you put in the path in the uh, and that's file. private. Right. And then um, actually this thing doesn't have a default route. Uh, this this laptop that I knew that I wasn't gonna have internet okay. access. But hang on just a second. Let me let, let me let me do this. One second. Uh, what was my let me go back to my instance. Let me assign a uh, public IP to it, assign a floating IP to it. Okay, so I've got 193. Now what I'm gonna do is um, Did I already change permissions on that? No. You already had a file there. Yeah, I know. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, so what we'll route do you have on, on the VM? See, it's going out through that bridge interface. So it should, if I have done things like turn on IP forwarding and blah, 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 blah. Actually, no, it should. That's what said. That's not something OpenStack does by default. Route you out to the fish. Yeah, you should. Let's take a look. It'll specify a route, but it won't, certainly won't on a single server also set up IPv forwarding in the kernel and all that lovely stuff to turn that No, no, no. It doesn't turn all that stuff yeah. You're going to have to set that up yourself. For doing I things think, like IP forward. No, no, I'm sorry if I made if I gave you that impression. No, you're you're gonna need to set it up. But um, hang on a second. It does. Yeah, that's uh, Libvirt does not modify this is gonna let file though. But you'll see that you see what happened when when we set this up. It set up all the IP tables rules, including um, DNAT and SNAT. So I mean it. The Packstack installer does do does set up the IP tables rules to enable that stuff. Now, I think the only thing OpenStack doesn't do is set the IP forwarding enabled. Right. And I think the rest of it is done. So you just set that, and then your private IP address can add out, and then you set a floating address up. Oh wow! Yes. Oh. Do we do that? And does Packstack do that, or did? Because the default for rel is off. So I'm assuming PackStack did it. I don't. I don't know. But the end result is, or should be. Wait, wait. It said puppet. Configured by puppet. Oh, did it? Oh, I didn't even look. Sworn. Oh. Yep. By puppet. While it still can be managed manually, it is definitely not recommended. Yeah, ignore that because puppet doesn't leave any infrastructure behind. So yes, it did. It went through and it fixed all that stuff for you. And actually, if you look at that, it turned down. It it, it did a bunch of stuff. It did a bunch of stuff on the bridging. So yeah, that's actually really impressive. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's what Puppet does. So anyway, so the good news—I mean, the cool thing is that now if we do, so I'm going to log back into that thing, and let's do ping 22.31.100. Dot. I think my my laptop is 60, and there you go. It works. So yes, you can ping out, and once you set up rules, you can ping in as well. So yeah, it's it's pretty cool stuff. I mean, I, I I'm I'm digging what I'm I'm still learning. I mean, OpenStack is still so new that there's still a lot of sort of you know sharp edges and embankment and stuff. Um, if you want to go further, you can go into volumes, uh, just like you saw me do earlier. If I set up a volume, I'll call it volume zero. Uh, you don't set a type because we've set up the super basic um, setting. But let's say I'm going to do a four gig volume, and I choose create volume. This is where the Swift stuff comes into place. I was brain damaged earlier. Wait, no, I mean, not, not Swift Lance. Sorry. Cinder. Cinder. God. God. <laughs> it has been an incredibly long week. So let me do this. LV display. So you, oh, hello. Wrong machine. Let's do that. So there you go. It created that volume. Four gigs. It's been a long week. Um, so now we should actually should be done. So now I can edit the attachment. I can say uh, attach it to that instance. I can call it slash dev slash whatever I want. It's still going to be uh, uh, VDB. 
because that's the next available log device. So I attach it. I think it depends on your guest OS. If it, uh, I, I know I yeah, it, it does work. Because yeah. I. Because I've tried. I've, I've tried, tried it in other distributions. Yeah. And it does work. Okay. So I'm thinking that's something to need. Probably so. I, I think the, uh, what's the release one? The, the tiny? Series. I think he said it's, uh, that's the need. default that's that kind of thing. I don't know. So I think it's a, uh, maybe a final version or something. Yeah. yeah. All right. Where were we? So instances. If I go to the console, like I said, when I go to the console, you see all the, the stuff that spews out that the kernel is basically, it's a, it's a triggered event, and it says that it's there. And now if I go and log out of here and SSH into the host, partitions, there's my new device, and it's four gigs. And that's persistent. That'll last. Even if this machine tanks and you have to terminate it, you can spin up another machine and attach it while your stuff's there. So that's it. That's I mean that's a super super basic uh, overview of Red Hat's implementation of OpenStack. Um, any questions? Yes. <coughs> Thinking about key management, is there any way to uh, predefine a set? <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> Preconfigure a set of key pairs like twenty or thirty or whatever for it to use as a tool so whenever it spins up a new instance, it takes the next one or have oh. a host name to key mapping or something like that. And that way, your admin log. Right. The keys and then as the VM set up, you can go right to VM. Yeah, you, you should have a set up a script. Yeah, you'd yeah. have to code that. Yeah. You'd have X code. Right. Yeah, you have nothing built in. You'd have to, no, there's nothing built in that I'm aware of. Um, but that, sh I mean, that shouldn't be difficult to do. You can generate, you know, you can do SSH key gen oh, multiple yeah. times. Uh, it's all that. Yeah, but, but I would do, yeah, but I would. The, the, the common pattern seems to be like a key pair, key pair per tenant. Yes. yes. Because generally a tenant is uh, like. Uh, project on itself, so a yeah. TV project okay. yeah. per, or, per, or a custom per group, but yeah. it's often actually per actual like functional thing. Like this is my website, and it's a tenant. This is my something else. That's it. Right. So um, yeah, it, it actually took me a while to kind of wrap my head around the idea of tenant networking and how, what is a tenant and and um, and I use project and tenant interchangeably because yeah. you know it's not confusing enough as is, um, but. What's that? Domain and guest. Yeah, domain and guest, yeah. So um, so it was described to me the most common, or that a common use case for a tenant network would be a customer. So maybe I've got a customer that's an internal customer, like a business unit, and they say, I need you know, I need to be able to do a burst because we got a Christmas rush coming, or I'm going to be doing big number crunching, and I need to, so that might be one tenant network. And you give them their own user accounts, and they could log in and spin up VMs to their heart's content based on what limits you set. Uh, and then another tenant, maybe another business unit, or maybe another customer externally, or whatever. But once I finally got that, I was like, ah, okay, that's what that means. But yeah, it's often a little bit deep. And like this with the um, security groups, they're a per tenant thing. Yeah. So if you want to be able to set security groups between your website and your yeah. database, you actually want to have them in separate tenants. So, or, or you just use IP tables on the guests themselves. Yeah. So don't use, like, don't do like double do Yeah. So, was this helpful? Okay, cool. So, if you take no other message away from this, but but this, it is that um, we are absolutely committed to OpenStack as a company. Red Hat is committed. We're not messing around. There's a reason we're the number one contributor to, to Grizzly. We're working like crazy to do as much as we can to make Havana really stable. We see this as incredibly valuable, and we're not we're not committing all this code because we want to dump our chests and talk about how awesome we are. We're committing this code because we are committed to the upstream community. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a little thump, thumping of chests going on there. No, no argument there. I'm proud to work for Red Hat. I'm proud of the work that we're doing. Uh, but, but we absolutely see this as valuable. We see the community as being incredibly valuable. I'm not kidding when I say if you want something done, please open up a feature request or open a Bugzilla at Red Hat, you know, bugzilla.redhat.com. Um, help us to make it better. Um, we're, it doesn't get better without your input. So. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And it didn't burst into flames too badly. I love it. <laughs>